Welcome everybody, dear delegates. Thank you for coming today in this rather impressive room, I have to say, it's really intimidating for me. My name is uh, Ines Prieto, I'm in charge of international affairs at La Cité de l'Espace. It's a place we will be talking about uh, soon and I will be uh, shortly introducing this session. Uh, this GNF session is organized by the Chinese Society of Astronautics and the Space Museums and Center, Center Committee within the IIF. Uh, it's the first GNF session dedicated to this topic. I hope uh, it's the first one of a long series. And today we are going to discuss the role of these institutions, uh, space museums, and their impact for our communities, for society at large, and within the space ecosystem. Uh, the theme of this year, the power of the past, the promises of the future, is absolutely and strikingly uh, relevant to our topic. When we read it, we, saw, we thought, okay, that's exactly what we do. That's exactly our jobs. So the power of the past. How are different countries, different institutions engage in preserving their scientific, industrial, emotional, and often political heritage? And we will hear the answers from uh, our speakers who come from three different countries. So I, I guess it will give a good perspective. And the promises of the future. How do these institutions work to educate our younger generation? What do they rely on to accomplish their mission? What is the future of their institutions? Where are they heading for? What are their promises to our future? To answer these questions, we have four distinguished speakers today. I'm very humbled and very impressed to be so close to them, actually. <laughs> Dr. Ellen Stoffan is a John and Adrian Mars Directors from the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. With more than 25 years of experience in space administration and planetary science, Dr. Stoffen was previously chief scientist at NASA, serving as a principal advisor to the administration on science programs and strategic planning. Welcome. And then I will introduce the other speakers. <laughs> I'm not calling you. Mrs. Mingzhu Zhang is the Director of International Relations Division of China Academy of Space Technology. She has been working for CAST for 20 years, actively engaged in developing space cooperation between CAST with science and European countries and promoting good relations with worldwide space administrations, industrial and academic organizations. Mr. William T. Harris is the President and CEO of Space Center Houston and the Manned Space Flight Education Foundation. Mr. Harris has more than 35 years of experience in nonprofit leadership and fundraising experience and was previously the California Science Center for Net Foundation Senior Vice President. And our last speaker will be Mr. Jean-Baptiste Desbois, the CEO of La Cité de l'Espace, which is the main science center in Europe dedicated to space. He's also leading L'Envol des Pionniers, an interpretation center dedicated to early aviation history. He has been leading for 30 years major touristic and cultural facilities in France. He is the chair of the Space Museum and Science Centers Committee, which he uh, strongly helped establishing in 2015. So after our speaker presentation, we might have a little time for exchange with the, with the audience. So without further ado, I invite Dr. Stoffen. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I've been the director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum for about a year and a half now. Um, and it's really been an incredible experience leading um, the most uh, favor favorite museum in the United States um, at the dawn of a new age of aerospace achievement. So how do museums keep up and remain relevant, engaging and inspiring, as is our role? This summer marked the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, which was more than a milestone in the space race. It was a high point, literally and figuratively, in human achievement. The first small steps on another world belong to everyone, everywhere, for all time. And for the 50th anniversary, we wanted to capture some of that energy and excitement of that moment for people too young to have experienced it firsthand and use it to show how museums can be central to the celebration of the past that inspire the future. We hosted a virtual space race with runners around the country contributing their miles. 
We hope to reach uh, the distance to the moon, but within 50 days, we had accumulated enough miles to almost make it to Mars. We produced astonishingly accurate life-size 3D scan statues of Neil Armstrong's spacesuit and placed them in baseball stadiums across the country, giving millions of people a chance to see a part of the national collection in their own towns and cities. And by the way, one of those statues is here in the exhibit hall in the Lunar Lounge, so please um, drop by and take a selfie with Neil uh, and share it on social media with the hashtag SnapTheSuit. We hosted lectures and film screenings and published books on the anniversary. And as a centerpiece for the national celebration of this international triumph, we built and launched a Saturn V rocket in the middle of Washington, DC. Well, sort of. Our Apollo 50 Go for the Moon show was no ordinary museum project. It involved projecting a full-scale 363-foot rocket the same one that took our astronauts to the moon onto the highest point in the city, the Washington Monument. For three nights, the Saturn V stood in the center of the city covered in spotlights just like it would have been on the launch pad in 1969. On the fourth and fifth nights, we launched it with full light and sound effects. The ground actually did shake, that's how big a speakers we had, and the air glowed red with flames from the engines. I hope some of you here today had a chance to see the show but for those of you who didn't, or those who want to relive it, I brought a clip with me so you can experience it for yourself. Okay, all flight controllers, go, no, go for power descent. Retro, go. Pido, go. Guide, go. Control, go. Calcom, go. GNC, go. Ecom, go. Surgeon, go. Capcom, or go for power descent. Eagle Houston, you reach your goal for a high defense. Mission 10%. Altitude will go high. Houston, you're looking at our delta H. Nice. Flight alarm looks good. Looking good, Doc. Overstepping its guidance. 1202. Same left. Retro. Go retro. Go down. 6 plus 2. Reading on the 1202 prime alarm. We have another 1202 alarm. 1202. What's that? If the executive overflow, if it's not occurring, then we're fine. We're, we're going on that flight. We're going on that alarm. Same time, we're go, flight. Okay, we're go. We're go. Same time, we're go. Single alarm. Tell them to leave it alone and we'll monitor it, okay? 875 feet. They're looking good down at half. Rod. He's taking it as a page, man. Rod. 60 seconds. Two and a half down. Face down. Four forward. on the National Mall with 
a half a million people over those two nights, even when it was 90 plus degrees outside, watching a Saturn V launch and experiencing the moon landing together, even though it had happened 50 years ago, there was nothing like it. It was quite an experience. And looking at the faces in the crowd, especially of the children, you could tell that they were being given a taste of what it was like in 1969, when for the first time in human history, the moon was within reach. Go for the Moon may have been a once-in-a-lifetime experience, but that's the kind of inspiration that I think museums, and certainly at the National Air and Space Museum, we need to deliver every day. It's a tall order to recapture the energy of history's greatest adventures, um, but we had it once. When construction began on our museum, Apollo hardware was still flying. The country was still buzzing with the excitement of the moon landings, even as television ratings had faded with subsequent missions. And a new race was on, in, uh, it was about 1974, to open a museum dedicated to the most American of innovations, human flight, by the country's bicentennial in 1976. The Air and Space Museum was going to be a birthday present to the American people, celebrating the journey from the first test flight on the beach at Kitty Hawk to the ultimate test flight to the Sea of Tranquility. It was a deadline 200 years in the making, but my predecessor, the museum's first director and Apollo 11 astronaut Michael Collins, was confident that it could be done. He would say, if we could put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, we could put a museum on the mall uh, by the bicentennial. Of course they did, and they succeeded, and the results have exceeded all expectations. Our building was designed to accommodate up to two million people a year, which sounded like a big number at the time, but more than two million people visited the museum the first month it was open, and 43 years later, our all-time visitorship has exceeded 350 million people, and it's growing every day. Many of you might know about our multi-year renovation project that we began last year. We need to modernize one of the world's most popular tourist destinations while remaining open for business for millions of visitors every year. This presents a challenge, but also an opportunity. We want to recapture the excitement the public felt when we first opened, when our one giant leap still echoed across the globe and the possibilities for exploration seemed limitless. To that end, we'll be reimagining all of our exhibitions, galleries, and public spaces to help inspire a second century of aerospace achievement. Our museum on the mall currently holds more than 3,800 artifacts, including some of aviation history's greatest icons, like the Wright Flyer, Amelia Earhart's Lockheed Vega, and John Glenn's Friendship 7. Our long partnership with NASA, beginning with our founding director, included an arrangement that transferred nearly all of the iconic artifacts of the Apollo era, from the spacesuits and spacecraft to the three remaining Saturn V rockets into the care of the Smithsonian. This ensured a national collection equal to the scope and complexity of the first space age. Our collection continues to grow to include both NASA spacecraft, like the Space Shuttle Discovery, but also examples of groundbreaking rocket motors from the private sector, like Virgin Galactic's rocket motor to, uh, from Spaceship Two, uh, the first flight of Spaceship Two, and of course yesterday's announcement of the Serato rover coming into our collection. 1,400 new objects will be included in our redesigned galleries on the mall, giving our visitors 1,400 new reasons to come back for another visit. Heading into the seven years of transformation at our museum that will touch every facet of, their work, of our work, our team remains really excited about this mission and to answer one important question. Our renovations will actually be completed in 2025, just ahead of the museum's 50th and the country's 250th anniversary. 50 years after we opened as a bicentennial present to the country, what is the role of our museums? And we can argue this largely. What is the role of museums, aerospace-related museums? Do we serve as a laurel wreath, or can, can we be a launch pad for future achievement? Human history has been punctuated by great feats of exploration, and for more than a century, aviation and spaceflight is where we've asked ourselves, what is next? Answering that question will take collaborations with sis, uh, sister science centers, space agencies, and other organizations equally as passionate about transforming our world. It'll take blockbuster spectacles like Go for the Moon, 
but it will also take the stories of inspiring men and women from all backgrounds who look like all of our population and all nations, stories that will resonate and connect with our visitors. The new National Air and Space Museum will bring our exhibitions fully into the 21st century and reflect where we're headed next. It'll look to the future while in using the past and present to show our visitors, no matter who they are, where they're from, no matter their race or gender or what challenges they face, they too can make what Steve Jobs called their dent in the universe. A recent example of that is our now annual She Can Summer Camp, which gives local young girls a one-of-a-kind opportunity to explore the science of flight and glimpse a variety of aerospace careers. This program is targeted to middle school when many students are considering career paths and forming lasting ideas that can inspire them through years of higher learning. And too often, it's at this young age when young women are discouraged from pursuing courses in science, technology, engineering, and math. What it all comes down to, what we are all up here on the stage driven by, is our opportunity to be a part of something larger than ourselves. The first people to walk on Mars will be some of the most famous individuals in history. No one knows right now who they'll be, but we know that at some point, they will walk through the doors of one of our museums in search of their path in the history books. And we know what we owe them to get there, a vibrant and inclusive economy, a STEM education pipeline that can build a nation of innovators and explorers capable of meeting the, the monumental challenge. We owe them a healthy planet to come home to, and our space museums and science centers owe them the spark that will fire a lifetime of discovery and wonder. Helping build that world is our mission at the National Air and Space Museum, and it's one that I know we share with all of you here today. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, Ine and uh, Mr. CEO from Citadel Space asking me as the speaker uh, to attend this GNF. So it's a great honor to present on behalf of China Aerospace and Science and Technology Corporation to present the China Space Exhibition Center. I would like to present uh, the overview, overview about the China space industry and also the exhibition center and uh, its influence on the education and the international exchanges and also the future prospects. So China space industry has been established since 1956. The number of satellites launched last year is 39. And the number of satellites in orbit is more than 300. So the production capacity in 1970s, it, is, it was one or two satellites till the production capacity so far nearly 100. And the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation is the major force of China space industry. It's also <coughs> engaged in launching vehicles, all kinds of satellites, and the China space station. So I'm from CAST, from, uh, also from the group company. CAST is China Academy of Space Technology. It's the key member of the mother company, CASC. And our portfolio covers six series of spacecraft, human spacecraft, lunar and deep space exploration, navigation, earth observation, telecommunications, space science. So after the uh, introduction of the China overall space industry, I will focus on the Chinese space exhibition. The older one is China Space Exhibition Hall of CAST was established in 2005. The exhibition area is 2,000 square meters. It shows the development of China space industry. And the new one, CAST Exhibition Center, was established in April of last year with an area of 5,000 square meters. It represents a booth showing the space achievements and technical capabilities. It is a stage of inheriting space spirits and culture. It is a platform of international exchange and cooperation. So the contents of, 
of the exhibition center, also the same as the portfolio of CAST. It covers the six series, navigation, communications, Earth observation, space science, lunar and deep space exploration, human space flight as well. The first one is navigation area. We show the different steps of navigation system. We call it a Beidou compass of Chinese own the navigation system. The first and the second generation was established before 2012. The third generation will be finished by 2020. That will be 35 satellites will offer a global coverage. And it is one of the four global the navigation system like uh, GPS, GLONASS, and Galileo. Chinese has own Beidou, the compass system. The second area is termication area. We are building Chinese own termication constellation, mainly for the mobile and the internet connection, etc. And we are developing DFH5, the super large capacity, the termication bus like Alpha Bus of Europe. So this one will be launched this year. And these are the partners outside China, and we deliver the communication and it's the ground applications to the worldwide, worldwide countries. The Earth observation area, we show the application of remote sensing satellites, covers remote, the high resolution resource, ocean, and environmental disaster monitoring. So the observation accuracy from visible spectrum to microwave <coughs> spectrum, et cetera. So the space science, it mainly shows the space science exploration programs like uh, new technology, de demonstration te uh, technology satellite, X-ray pulsar-based navigation, hard X-ray telescope, and electromagnetic monitoring test satellite. It is a joint program between China with Italy. And also we have the joint program between China and France, like the ocean observation satellites. In the lunar and deep space exploration, it mainly shows also three steps of the national plan. It includes orbiting, landing, and sample returning. So, and also the future Mars explorations, asteroid, and other planetary exploration, etc. In the fields of human space flight, we also have three step plan of the of China human program. The first one is manned space flight. And we have did the second step, EVA, space lab, rendezvous and docking. The third step will be the final space station. That will be a 9010 level of space station. It's the same function as the International Space Station. The call module, call module is where the astronauts lived and worked. And also it contains two experimental modules and also the Shenzhou manned spacecraft and the Tiangong cargo spacecraft to carry astronauts and cargo. So the influence of the space to the citizen innovation. By showing the milestone of China space industry development, the exhibition center shows to the public that China space spirit heritage, you can see the sculpture of the space father of China, Mr. Qian Xuesen. Also, he used to, to live in USA. And there will be an introduction video before you go into the exhibition center. So the exhibition center disseminates the achievements, help the public to understanding and perception of the space development. And uh, every year we, we received over 1,000 of delegations, around 10,000 guests. Space inspires students to create enthusiasm by interacting in space, uh, training and uh, teaching in the, in the space awareness. CAST uh, receives over 1,000 students visit per year. And so far, CAST has received more than 50 visits by heads of foreign countries and more than 100 visits by ambassadors or ministers. It has been praised by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Com Commerce as a window for China to show high-tech industry to the worldwide visit. These are the examples of the heads of the countries and the ministers and ambassadors and the heads of the the space agency like uh, 
ESA and NASA, like a Michael Griffin, like a Borden. Uh, we even have received the US Department of State and the Space Foundation delegation to visit the CAST. And also French President Mr. Macron just visited last year. So the CAST Exhibition Center is becoming the window to show the world a good image of China space. These are the examples that uh, professionals receive the training from, from CAST and also to do the on-site exhibition visit. And these space professionals dedicate to, to space development for their own country after training. This is the status of the current uh, space uh, exhibition center of China. Now we are enlarged into a new one. It will advance with the times. There will be uh, a VR technology and human computer interaction technology. Visitor can land on the space station a simulated one and experience the state of witless environment and wearing of the cabin clothes. With more 4D seminars, um, ring and a ball screen displays throughout, throughout VR, AR experience, the audience will be led to the space environment. So China will build the future space park and the Zhongshan, where it is located in Guangdong province, that will be a space park like uh, Disney, 500 acres, including interactive experience, space green, entertainment facilities, will be the intelligent space park. The second one will be located in Foshan. In Foshan, Space Experience Center. It will be Starship Titanic. It's much more experience, um, space tour, etc. So to conclude my presentation, the exhibition plays a very important role in facilitating international exchange and also to stimulating the citizen innovation. So because of the outer space is the common interest of human beings and China never stops to, to exploring and the peaceful use of the outer space. We are looking forward to working together with outside. Thank you. Good morning. I'm excited to share some brief comments for, uh, with you about the California Science, uh, the Space Center Houston um, as soon as I get my screen up. There we go. OK. So I'm going to go back one. Um, Space Center Houston is um, an official visitor center for NASA Johnson Space Center, but it also is an independent 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to being a dynamic science learning destination. Uh, just briefly about our facility, we host more than a million visitors a year. And actually, this year, we'll re receive more than 1.2 million. So I think this is part of a trend of great public interest worldwide and also nationally in space exploration. We have a major focus on being a dynamic learning destination, welcoming more than 200,000 educators and students every year to participate in our programming. And we've actually made a big change in how we approach the interpretation of um, space and space exploration and STEM learning, where a lot of aerospace museums are very focused on the objects and building the experiences around those objects. We're really driven by what are strategic learning goals and objectives? What do we want people to walk away with and then identifying those objects that support um, those learning goals and objectives. We're also a, made a top priority diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, that everyone is welcome in our facility. In fact, we're the first science center in the world certified as an autism service center. So all of our staff has gone through review, uh, um, training, testing, and review our physical plant to ensure that people on the autism spectrum can really access all of our exhibits and programs and we're also very committed to including people with different learning abilities um, in space exploration. And we find that that has been part of the reason our attendance has increased so significantly. And we have a major economic impact in our region of over $118 million as of 2018. Um, we know that space is a powerful way to engage the public. It, it's, we see this among youth, and I think all of you in the audience and the panel here have experienced this, that there's tremendous interest in space exploration, and it's a great platform and way to engage people around STEM learning. 
And as I mentioned, we're really committed to being accessible to everyone. In fact, we work with organizations like Dogs for the Blind to provide seeing, uh, training for seeing eye dogs, the Alzheimer's Association to provide memory nights for individuals uh, living with Alzheimer's, among many other groups. Something we're very proud about uh, is with the Apollo 50th anniversary, of course, we are where Apollo Mission Control is located. We manage all the human flights out of Mission Control at, at uh, NASA Johnson Space Center. There are actually five control rooms in that facility, including the historic Apollo control room, and that was completely restored and opened in time for the 50th anniversary. So I encourage you all to come visit our facility. So this is our focus on the past, understanding where we've come from. Uh, this room is completely animated to recreate the uh, landing of Apollo 11 on July 20th, 1969. And then we focus on the present, where are we now, what are we learning from current missions. We have a major uh, exhibit on the International Space Station. Uh, we also take our visitors into the visitor viewing area where you can see the flight controllers actually flying and controlling the International Space Station. We interpret that with education programs. But we also focus on where we're going into the future with a major exhibit looking at what will it take based on current knowledge to send humans to Mars. And you actually go through the stages of preparing for a mission preparing your suit, seeing if you will survive in that spacesuit, preparing your mission, and also uh, we have a Mars sample that you can touch. We also have a lunar sample you can touch as well from Apollo 17. So I just want to give an example of our robust education programs. Our focus with our education programming is how to build and augment that natural curiosity and inquisit inquisitiveness that we all have as human beings, and to really build those analytical skills, critical thinking skills, how to really pursue a challenge, go around, work with through challenges, and also deal with adversity. So one of our um, award-winning programs is called Space Center University. It's a five-day immersive program that runs 51 weeks a year with a high participation from students from all over the world with a middle school track, high school. Uh, we also work with college-level students. And we have, a, we, in our middle school track, we focus on the students preparing a lunar mission with a lunar habitat and for the high school level, a Mars habitat. And I'm gonna show you a brief video in a moment about this program so you get a sense of what it's like for the students who participate. But I also want to share that we're also very focused on educators for both teachers and informal educators with an annual conference called the Space Exploration Educators Conference, which happens the first week of February. And our conference this year is called Gateway to Achievement, looking at preparing to go back to the moon and onto Mars. So I'm going to run a brief video now so you can see firsthand what our Space Center U program is like. I thought it would, let's see. Maybe not. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Here we go. A little delay. That is just one of many of our education programs at Space Center Houston. I encourage you to check out our website at spacecenter.org to learn more. One other thing I want to share is we've recently received a, a major grant through the Boeing Corporation to advance a girl STEM initiative on something we're very committed to and now we're taking to a whole new level. That will engage more than 1,400 uh, girls and young women a year in an intensive program to encourage them to pursue careers in uh, science and engineering, technology and math. Thank you.
Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's my turn now to introduce the Cité d'Espace and its educational uh, activities. So Cité d'Espace uh, is not located uh, near a lounge pad. That's a shame for us, or to uh, center control, such as, uh, such as in Houston. We are located in Toulouse, which is south of France, and it is the European capital for space. Uh, it means two things. First of all, uh, qu quantity, 25% of the jobs uh, in, France, in Europe for space, uh, the space industry are based in the area of Toulouse. But it, it's also a question of density. We have in Toulouse the whole value chain, chain uh, uh, about space. The CNES, French Space Agency, is in Toulouse. Also research labs, universities, and higher education, industries, space clusters, also for R&D and RRT. And also City Space is part of this uh, value chain. And Toulouse has a strong historical connection with the sky. First, you, you see a map, a very old map, geocentric map, 30th century, which is in the Basilica in Toulouse. And in Toulouse also, we have the second oldest univers university in France. More recently, after the First World War, Toulouse was one of the worldwide birthplace of the aviation. We opened last December a new interpretation center about this human adventure. And I'm sure you know the little prince. It has been wrote, it was wrote by um, a pilot in Toulouse uh, in the 19, he was in Toulouse in the 1920s. It is, uh, um, his name is Saint-Exupéry. So he wrote the little prince. Cité d'Espace is a five hectare facility welcoming 400,000 visitors per year. It's uh, the, the largest one in Europe, increasing by 50% since 2012, and since a new strategy based on education. But it's more than its facilities, indoor and outdoor facilities. Cité d'Espace is a place where people gather to share the goals of space missions, where we work to inspire youth, especially uh, young female, to scientific and space careers, and where the space actors meet. We were founded, we, we, we were founded in 97 on three, on a three pillar basis. First one, you see the local and regional governments to disseminate towards citizens about science and space, and also, as Toulouse I said, is the European capital for space. Also, the space players, second pillar, which needed a showcase and a voice towards the general public, and City Despace is a kind of common house for them. And third pillar, the Ministry of Education to contribute through informal education to inspire school children and students. So we are therefore definitely a science center dedicated to space, whose goals are education, education, and again, education for the general public and the school children, using all possible means to attract people to space activities and to science. And we are a global science center with a strong international focus. It means especially three things. The first one, international networks, such as here in uh, this uh, AEC, uh, AEF, and AEA Congress. Uh, also, you see EXI, the European Network for Science Centers, the IPS for planetariums, and also the World Space Week. I am the coordinator, national coordinator for France and in the, in the board of the World Space Week Association. It's also programs with, for example, the American Alliance of Museums. We had cooperation with, uh, with the team um, uh, of uh, William Harris and the Houston Space Center, for example, with the European Commission, with the ESA, also touring exhibitions. Um, we also had exhibitions, for example, all over in different countries in the world. And that's also on site. And we are very, uh, very an international site. We present a worldwide range of space activities in the uh, So you have a look, for example, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, first of all, we speak about France. This is the first satellite in France, Asterix, and thanks to this, France became the third nation to, to succeed to launch a, a satellite on, on, the, on the sky. It was in 65. Europe, IN5. 
but also USA, thanks to a loan, long-term loan from NASA, we have a moon rock from Apollo 15, or those things, but that's an example. We speak also, uh, I'm sorry, we, we speak also about, uh, about uh, Soviet Union and Russia. We have a genuine mirror station at Cité d'Espace, an engineering model. And a few months ago, we installed in Cité d'Espace a Chang 4 uh, and a UT2 model thanks to a long-term loan from the CASC, the China Aeronautics Science and Technology Corporation. So we inaugurated that on the 18th of September. That's that, that was very interesting for us to, to have this uh, very interesting model of a very uh, exceptional mission. So as a space educational facility, we are very keen on this year's IEC theme the power of the past and the promise of the future. This is something we address every day uh, to our visitors. For example, I'll give this example for this year, we themed, as most of them uh, today, uh, we theme all this year around the moon, the moon missions, yesterday, today, tomorrow. We address the past always considering the future. And I like your expression when you said uh, we are launch pads for future achievements. Yes, we totally agree with you on the point of view. How do we, uh, how does the past shape our present? What does it say for the future? How does it inspire us? So on the historical side, we've displayed for years, thanks to the run of NASA, the moon rock. We installed last of July a scale one model of the Apollo 11 lunar module. Also an airstream, we painted a giant Armstrong feet, uh, footprint which is shot by satellites. So you can see this from, uh, from the, uh, the, the space. So it's very amazing to have pictures of city space with this uh, giant footprint. On the present site, one of the most spectacular, I said this, was the Changi 4. So we have now this, uh, this offer in the city of space. And um, we offer a dance uh, program of activities dedicated to the moon, actual missions, programs, always with an international approach. And now back to the future. We opened last April an exhibition, Moon, We Are Back, where visitors are emerged into a moon village where questions like, how may we live on the moon? How will we work there? Which kind of mission will be possible are addressed to the public. Since, since the Future Lives Education, we organize every year a scientific congress for primary school children aged around 10, like a kid's ISE. After months of preparation mentored by FIDI students, they present their work during the congress in June, and the theme of this 10th edition was Design Your School on the Moon. And this is a job, a great job we do with the university and the Ministry of Decreation. And now to encapsulate all of this, I will conclude my presentation with a short movie of the Apollo Day, a large public event we organized on July 21st. On a piece of paper? No? Right, well done. So here you have, a, it was a large national event, so here we have some national broadcasts. a very famous uh, scientific journalist in France, and an overview of Cité de l'Espace and the different buildings. It was a very intense work for a very motivated team, as you see. We welcome more than 15,000 visitors, in fact, more than 17, and people could ask questions to our speakers thanks to connected bracelets. So all, uh, all, all along the day, along the lamb, we had animation speakers about the history, for example, Ron Paulus, and as an engineer of the Apollo missions, or Jenny Schultz with the peanut mascot. And for the present and future missions, we had astronauts, scientists, space agencies, engineers, also an architect working on extreme environments, and especially thinking about architecture on the moon, on Mars, and so on. So here you have the view on the moon exhibition, moon, we are back. You saw the moon rock, the moonwalk, scientific games around the moon, we, have an, we, have the, we have still now the Apollo 11 movie 
in the IMAX theater, the Mir station here, the peanut, uh, yeah, the IMAX. So we have interactive discovery of the solar system in the planetarium, and also we have a cupola. So this was the largest event in Europe dedicated to Apollo 15. So you see all the hands-on and activities of the space vacuum and. And we also have a, a mapping on the Orion 5, less than yours, <laughs> the, the obelisk in Washington. But uh, so I let you appreciate now the terrific fa final show we, we, we did, we organized. So in 69, there were 400,000 people working uh, for the Apollo missions in 2019, we were 400 in uh, uh, working on this uh, on this large event. So that's it. You are welcome in Toulouse to 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 to, to come to to Cité de l'Espace uh, shortly during the ISE 2021 because it will be you know in Paris, in, in France, and Toulouse and Cité de l'Espace will be largely involved in. So welcome to 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 Toulouse, to Cité de l'Espace, and to to the educational, educational missions we we organize. Thank you to you. So thank you for all our speakers. And now we have some time for questions and answers. There should be a volunteer with a mic. If he's not here, I will, oh, okay, he's here. So I see there's a question there. Very inspirational presentations. Thank you for, all, for you all. Um, I have a tricky question. I don't know if, uh, um, if your um, institutions are, um, you are, they are public institutions, but still uh, uh, financial data may be uh, classified. But if you could somehow, um, you may probably know each other's budgets, annual budgets, and so on. Can you somehow? Uh, put the four institutions uh, in a scale of which one is the most lucrative or how are you doing with your budgets? Can you say something about how freely you can imagine and create these incredible shows? Or also fellowships and research projects, what you have? Yeah, I will um, say to start out with, the Smithsonian is an unusual institution around the world. It's, a, it's a, actually a trust instrumentality of the federal government, and what that means is not entirely clear. But our budget is about 60% from the federal government and about 40% private funds either raised at the museum itself through the gift shop and food uh, or through private donations. The Apollo show and all the Apollo activities that, that you saw that I talked about today, I should have mentioned, those were generously supported by the Boeing Corporation uh, with also support from Raytheon. So a lot of these special activities we do are definitely privately supported. Uh, the summer camp, uh, for example, that I talked about, the Girls Aviation Summer Camp was supported by the Walton Family Foundation. So we really rely on, on private dollars to do programming and for our exhibitions where our buildings, we can actually rely on the federal government. For example, the restoration of the building downtown, which was falling apart, is a $650 million project that is funded by the federal government. We are raising $250 million uh, to restore the gallery. Um, so we are a, a strange combination of a public and private institution. Um, so I can say for the United States, they're, very, they're different financial models for museums and science centers. So Space Center Houston is one of 14 NASA visitor centers across the country, and everyone has a different financial model. So for example, the Kennedy Center Visitor Complex is actually run by a for-profit company called Delaware North, and their <coughs> revenue goes into a trust. In our case, we're a separate nonprofit organization, completely independent, and so we conform with all of the nonprofit laws of the United States. Almost, most of our revenue currently is earned income, which means we charge admission, we have a retail store. We do a really robust eventing business. We do over 200 events a year for external groups that we make revenue from. We have a whole track in executive leadership training that's also a revenue stream, so we have very diverse revenues. We also receive contributed support. Traditionally, it's been around specific new exhibits and similar to Smithsonian and new projects. 
but our annual operating budget is about $30 million. And we're, since we're a nonprofit organization in the United States, that is published publicly. So you can go online and look at our tax filing uh, to see what our structures are like. But other institutions in the country, some of the visitor centers may actually be in either a state or a city facility where they pay no rent um, because it's a benefit at their educational institutions for their regions. So there, there are lots of, there are many different financial models and you have to look at what makes the most sense for where you're located and what your mission is. I hope that answers your, helps answer your question. So regarding city dispense, we are, what we can in France, uh, we have a special scheme. It means that we are a limited company to operate city dispense, but we are a kind of non-profit limited company. It's a bit uh, paradoxical, but I mean that it means that uh, our main shareholders are local governments and also the CNES, the French Space Agency, and so on. So they don't ask us for dividends and so on. They put money in a limited company, but without any uh, asking us any profit, uh, any uh, dividends and so on. That's first. Then we have a budget around 20, uh, 15 or 20 million euros, uh, on which around a bit less than 30% came uh, from the local government, from the Toulouse, okay, for the edu educational programs ma mainly on that point of view. We share a lot of things with the Houston Space Center where you said we, we had a lot of your revenues also from ticketing but also from shops or restaurants. Also we organize a lot of B2B events, seminars and so it's a way for um, firms and employees of firms to come to Citadel Space by another way Maybe they will not come to Citadel Spa, they come because they are firm or uh, ask them to come and they discover Citadel Spa and you, you have, it's a first step also for science and so on. I think one thing that's very common to all of us is, is that importance of corporate and private support. Yeah. Um, and I think all of us would take really seriously our role of we really feel like we're igniting the spark that supports the future workforce of the aerospace industry, and so it's such a strong and important partnership, I think, for all of us. And maybe another point that you're right, is that uh, I may not be wrong, uh, we produce, we conceive our contents. We are not only marketing firms, if I can say that way. We conceive our contents, exhibition, educational programs, curation for you more than for me, but uh, that's it. But we conceive that things, that's very important. We, are, we, we, we do the complete range of the activities of what you saw just at the present time. I think I would just add that when you're looking at your revenue budget, how you're going to garner resources, look at what takes the least effort to produce the greatest return. <laughs> because you can put a lot of focus in a particular path and it may require a lot of resources, both staff and budget, with a really nominal return. But for your region and wherever you are in the world, really strategize and look at how you can create the greatest return for the least amount of effort, is what I would suggest. And one thing also that you, you cannot uh, value is the expertises we get, but I think you too, from uh, uh, space agency members, from engineers in uh, Airbus, TAS, and so on, uh, scientists and so on, they work a lot with them, with, with us, to rewrite or to prepare the next exhibition, to rewrite or to reread uh, what we prepare and so on. So that's very important, but you cannot value it. Hi, thanks. Uh, my name is Marianne Mater. I'm the executive director of the Canadian Association of Science Centers. <laughs> um, I was really inspired this year to see all the global events around Apollo 15. And I was wondering if you could speak to some of the other international campaigns, anniversaries, um, that you all kind of participate in, or perhaps as a, a global network we choose to participate in, whether that's World Space Week, maybe it's International Science Center Science Museum Day, or maybe you could speak to some other examples, or upcoming anniversaries, thanks. Well, I would just say two upcoming anniversaries this coming year that I'm really excited about. It's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, uh, is actually coming up um, in April uh, of 2020. Uh, obviously, space observa Earth observations has played a critical role in our understanding of the planet, and obviously, um, Earthrise, you know, started the environmental movement, and that's something that's really important to all of us. So I know certainly at the Smithsonian, we're 
placing a lot of emphasis on that anniversary. And then one which we're in the early planning stages, and so I'm really excited about is the upcoming 20th anniversary of the International Space Station. Um, and frankly, we're, I, I feel like we're behind in our planning for this, but I'm, I think it's, it's one of those things we're all gonna be putting a lot of focus on in the upcoming year. I mean, I would add that. Uh, there, there are so many great occasions to celebrate, and I would add to the things that Ellen had said, we have, of course, the other Apollo anniversaries coming up, the anniversary for Apollo 12 on November 13th, and then Apollo 13 in April of 2020 uh, are, are really important because they're all examples of overcoming incredible challenges. Many of you may know Apollo 12 was hit twice by lightning as it was launching and all the systems went flat. And then with, of course, Apollo 13 goes without saying, you know, the incredible human challenge of going and returning, you know, bringing those astronauts back safely. Um, there are a couple of other things coming up. For those of you interested or from around the world, there's something that happens every three year called the Science Center World Summit. The last one was in Tokyo, and the next one will be in 2020 in Mexico City. And that's when the various associations, the Canadian Aztec, Excite, ASPAC, all come together and share common goals and strategies on effectively engaging the public in science learning. And that's going to be a phenomenal experience. It's a really great idea to learn about regional strategies and build greater international collaborations. So you spoke about anniversaries, but uh, also the future. At one point, uh, we were thinking about one thing for us. It's about Mars 2020 mission uh, to the, the famous mission, which will go to Mars on normally it will be launched on the 17th of July next of July. So this is something we want to share with our colleagues from NASA, from the Houston Space Center, maybe Kennedy Space Center and so on. Uh, at least or especially also because France is involved in this mission because we, uh, the, the CNES uh, through uh, uh, Toulousian lab, research lab, uh, has conceived and will operate the chemical camera of the Mars 2020, such was it was the case on the Curiosity. It was a French uh, mission or lab for the ChemCam. So this is an example of it. And this is, but we discussed that yesterday during the Space Museums and Science Centers Committee. It is one of the role of this committee to share best practices, but also to share anniversaries, to, to, do, to, to see what we can do together to, to, to involve and to, to launch the future. As you said. Something I'd like to add that isn't necessarily a date, but it's a way to engage the public is there are increasingly challenges that you can engage the public and community science uh, initiatives. We have one with Space Center Houston. If you go to our website, it's called the Innovation Gateway, and we partner with the private sector and ask them to put cash prizes up to engage the public in coming up with solutions. So we're actually the... Um, Ally partner with NASA on the next Space Robotics Challenge, which this round application closes in December, but anyone can apply and participate in those. And it's a really great way to excite uh, your local constituents or people who go to your institutions in these challenges, because many of them are international. It doesn't matter, matter physically where you are, you can participate. We have, we have some time for one final question. Um, thank you very much for fascinating presentations. Um, I work at the Science Museum in London, and like all of you, we welcome vast numbers of young people. Uh, I believe we're the most uh, visited centre for school parties in Europe. However, uh, I'm wondering about uh, the older audiences who don't yet realise they're interested in space, and what your thoughts are as to how they can be enticed to come and be involved in your displays and exhibitions. Um, we, we do worry about that also. How do we get that sort of um, 20 to 35-year-old population, um, which I think is the population you're talking about engaged? Um, this is going to sound terrible. Um, evening events with beverages um, tend to be the best way. And so we've done things like Yuri's Night. I mean, obviously, there's models uh, around the country of people. Fr frankly, it's an area that we're trying to expand of how do we go where they are? We started a podcast, which a lot of, I know certainly my kids are in that age range and all they do is listen to podcasts. So we've really started a whole strategy of where are people of that age and who do we partner with to go to where they are? And then how do we sort of look at our special events and evening events and tailor some of them more towards that age range? 
I would say I don't think there's any silver bullet, but what's most important is data. So I'm a big advocate of doing research, focus groups, going out to those populations you're trying to engage and asking them, what do they find interesting about your facility? And testing concepts and ideas, and not to think of it as a one-off. It should be something you regularly do, and it's worth investing working with professionals who do market research to help inform your decisions, because you're never gonna have enough time or budget to do everything that you want to do, you aspire to do, so you really wanna have as much information as possible. And then I'm also a really big advocate of testing. So try it out, collect data, try different approaches and see how uh, your publics respond. We've had great success, similar to what Ellen described with something called our Starlight Socials. It started out kind of bumpy. We had to make, we had to make changes to it over time and collected information, but it is libations after hours and we build in science, but we'll have our scientists and educators, and we'll bring in uh, uh, volunteers from Johnson Space Center, where we'll do observation with telescopes, and we'll do pop-up talks that are only eight minutes long or 10 minutes long on different topics. And it's a chance to have a dialogue discussion. So uh, you know, it's, it's a great way to provide a social network for people around common interests. This is really often the glue that helps drive that audience. When we look at our demographics, and this is more typical in the United States, at science centers, there was this assumption that we were locate destinations for families with children. And what we find is, for example, at Space Center Houston, 70% of our visitors are adults. So we don't want to be overly kid-focused. We want to appeal to those, younger, those families with younger kids, but we have to pay attention to that other adult audience and what their interests are. So we've, we've introduced a lot of programming that appeal to young adults and uh, middle age and also seniors. From babies to grannies. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for all, all these uh, so interesting speaks. Maybe we can give our speakers a little round of applause.